Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Southwest Family Fellowship. Uh, those of you here live in the room, we got a little bit more of a crowd today. It's exciting to see folks uh, back, but the lion's share, of course, at home, and uh, good to have you with us wherever you're watching us from. Uh, this morning, we are uh, continuing today our summer series. We're spending the summer uh, looking for ancient solutions to modern problems through the prayer book of God's people, the book of the Psalms. And perhaps no problem uh, in our nation is talked about more, and I would say understood less, than the topic of values. Right? Everybody wants to talk about values, especially in an election year, right? Vote your values. Who's the values candidate? Uh, the, the two political party conventions uh, in our nation were held over the last fortnight. Plenty of values talking both of them. In fact, here is a campaign quote by the current president. As long as we are true to our values, loyal to our citizens and faithful to our God, we will not fail. And here's a campaign quote by the man who hopes to be the next president. All our differences hardly measure up to the values we all hold in common. So, why don't we just flip a coin, right? Clearly, both of these individuals are for our values, right? Why go through it? Though? Let's just, it's going to be the same. Rightly, you would, you know, mock the naivete of that statement and uh, certainly intended naivete, of course. Uh, of course, depending on which candidate you are for, uh, you'll assume I'm mocking the other one. Uh, but, but actually, I'm trying to illustrate the great modern problem with talking about our values. How do we determine our values? Now, before we get too far into that topic, we actually need to read our psalm uh, for this morning. Psalm 19 is, is one of the greats. It's this, if you're, you know, I, I imagine a, a concert one day with David in heaven, and people are like, play the hits. You know, he wants to do some obscure psalm. No, play the hits. Psalm 19 is one of the hits, and um, it is about two different ways of knowing God. Uh, you can see the break point in it if you look closely, and I'm going to show you that in a minute as we walk through. But the first half is about knowing God through his natural creation. And then the second half is about knowing God through his revealed will, through God's word. Uh, and we could really break this into two sermons. We're not going to take the time to do that. Instead, uh, I, I want to focus on the second half. There's a lot of great things in the first half about uh, creation care and our role as stewards of the earth and all these things. Um, but I want to focus on where it relates to where we are in this cultural moment in regards to values. So uh, if you're here with us, if you'd put your mask back on for a second, if you have taken it off, and so we can read this all together. If you're at home, please... As crazy as it sounds, I'd like you to say this out loud with us. There's something about the psalm that's meant to be spoken out loud. So here we go. We'll read it, and then we'll break it down. All together. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the works of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes the circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then will I be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May the words of my mouth 
and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. There you go, Psalm 19. Uh, and I've said that this is especially uh, the second half speaking to us about values. Let me start off, uh, if I could, by offering you a quick a cultural history of contemporary values, kind of the conventional wisdom uh, on this. I was born near the start of a three-decade spree of unlimited personal freedoms, right? The 60s, the 70s, and, and the 80s, and, and really the 60s as we think of them didn't really begin till the late 60s. Um, but these decades were all about getting as much personal freedom, relational freedom, freedom, sexual, moral, financial, authoritative, get as much freedom as you could while sneering at the old values of self-control and chastity and honesty and thrift and modesty and self-denial. Sex is free, greed is good. So that was the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. And then in the 90s, the entire society began to wake up with a monstrous cultural hangover. And uh, we begin to realize that we were facing a values uh, vacuum. Books in the 90s began to address this. Uh, In the political realm, Education Secretary William Bennett wrote a bestseller in 1993 called The Book of Virtues. This was a huge, huge book. Uh, A a collection of morality stories. Uh, In the business world, in 1994, Jim Collins wrote an insanely influential book called Built to Last that made the case that many of the best companies adhered to a set of principles called core values. Uh, The resulting values fad swept through corporate America faster than lice to a kindergarten classroom. I mean, it's just, the result is that today, 80% of Fortune 100 companies uh, publicly flaunt their values. Next time you go into a a store, a grocery store, store, look for it. Look for the value statement of the company on on, on the wall. Uh, Enron had one of the most uh, splendid set of corporate values imaginable, proudly displayed in the front of their 2000 uh, annual report. Right before it was discovered, they had built millions of investors, defrauded the Securities and Exchange Commission, robbed tens of thousands of employees of their retirement funds, and collapsed in a cloud of dust that took the Houston economy down with it for a time. So, <laughs> values, but it, you know, how seriously are we taking them? In the religious world now, the, the 90s saw uh, the evangelical church in America, and that's my tribe, I feel like I can speak to it more, uh, really up their game in the naked pursuit of political power to force public morality. There was a movement in county after county, state after state, to have the Ten Commandments displayed uh, in courthouses and other government buildings. Uh, biblical values in many ways became a club used to beat society uh, into morality. Perhaps no one represented the mingling of values, Christianity, and open political partisanship more uh, than the president of the largest Christian uh, university in the world, Jerry Falwell Jr. I should say former president, because if you've read the news this week, I would not recommend the Falwell family values uh, package. Uh, Today, the emphasis is on personal values. We have, for the last decade or so, seen enough uh, of the emptiness of the rat race to know that in order to be happy, you have to live for something uh, besides the corporate bottom line. And so you read articles, and they're just scads of these, but articles uh, like a recent one from Psychology Today called Six Ways to Discover and Choose Your Core Values. Here's an excerpt. Everybody is different. And what makes one person happy may leave another person feeling anxious or disengaged. Defining your personal values and then living by them can help you feel more fulfilled and to make choices that make you happy, even if they don't seem to make sense to other people. So you see there? It's your personal values. Who defines values? You do. You have to figure out uh, your own moral compass. No pressure. Yeah. Uh, David Brooks is a uh, New York Times op-ed columnist. Uh, their conservative columnist is how he's advertised. By the way, quick aside, I, I like the New York Times, uh, and I'll tell you why. Because the New York Times is vilified by both the political left and the political right. So they must be doing something right. 
Uh, but anyway, in 2013, David Brooks wrote uh, an influential book called The Road to Character, in which he talked about that he had, he'd come to realize that he had spent most of his life pursuing uh, what he called resume virtues, stacking up a list of impressive accomplishments, but at what he now had come to realize was the cost of his, his soul. So he wrote a book about the importance of pursuing character values like honesty and courage and integrity and, and determination. It was, it was a number one bestseller. Uh, and then right after he wrote the book, his 27-year uh, marriage broke apart. His personal life went into a, a tailspin. And, and just this week, I picked up his, his latest book in which he attempts to make up for the failures of the previous book. I bought the book thinking it was a, a sequel of sorts. No, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a replacement, really. Uh, he says that he has come to learn that building character is not like uh, going to the gym where through individual focus and a lot of willpower, you can build up your own uh, personal values. He, he calls this new book The Second Mountain, which is a metaphor uh, for a life of focusing on communal rather than personal values. Let me read you a quote from it. He says, when I wrote The Road to Character, I was still enclosed in the prison of individualism. I now think the rampant individualism of our current culture is a catastrophe. The emphasis on self Individual success, self-fulfillment, individual freedom, self-actualization is a catastrophe. I now think that living a good life requires a much vaster transformation. It's not enough to work on your own weaknesses. The whole cultural paradigm has to shift from the mindset of hyper-individualism to the relational mindset of the second mountain, which again, by which he means uh, cultural uh, values. And I applaud his change of heart. I agree with him wholeheartedly about the great sin of radical American individualism. It, it is real. It is, it is tearing us apart. It's bipartisan. You see it on display uh, in the extremes of, of both the abortion issue and the gun rights issue. Right? Different political leaning, leanings, but the root sin uh, is rampant individualism. Right? Societal consequences be damned. These are my rights. Only I can define my personal values. And, and, and so I agree with uh, a lot of the things that David Brooks is saying uh, in his new book. But I tell you, I am anticipating his next book in which I am sure he will spend a thousand pages trying to define just what exactly cultural values are supposed to look like. Right? And that may be unjust. I haven't finished the book yet. But this brings us back to where we started. What are cultural values? You're supposed to get Biden's values or Trump's values. Psalm 19 says, no, just, just no. And I think it shows us three things that will lead us to the values that will aid in human flourishing, regardless of our personal politics, uh, no matter our nationality, no matter uh, our generation in time and in place. So let's dig into this, all right? The first thing that we're taught, is that moral values must be based on universal moral absolutes. So-called moral values have to be based on universal moral absolutes. See, universal is not personal. Universal is not societal. Both of those are too subjective. Right? Think about this. Think about an art gallery. Okay? Uh, uh, go to an art gallery. Uh, what is a painting worth? Well, it's worth different to me than it is to you. Right? That's why we have auctions, right? We, we, we put it on auctions, and, and it might not be much, worth much at all to me, but it might be worth a lot to you, so we have an auction, and we force, force the person you know, who values it the most to pay for it. Uh, I, I might never bid on it, right? Because to me, it's got zero value. To you, it may be you know, the pearl of great price, because valuing is relative and subjective. But Psalm 19.9 says this, the ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. Now, this is very, very important. So what does that mean? Uh, in, in English, the word, unfortunately, the word righteous, it, what does it mean? It means, uh, you know, condescending, right? To look down your nose. Righteous people look down their nose, especially self-righteous people, right? Uh, the Hebrew word, though, means something else. The Hebrew word actually means a straight-edge tool, 
That's the, that's the literal definition. Uh, you can't build a building. You couldn't build one 3,000 years ago. You can't build one today without a straight edge tool. What's a straight edge tool? It is an instrument for measuring proper angles, okay? Measuring what you do. It's an instrument that is not your own uh, judgment. There are so many ways in which the judgment of the naked eye, the intuition, the hunch, uh, cannot be trusted. I've been watching this great documentary on, uh, on the Disney Plus channel. You know, we're running out of stuff. I was like, during COVID, I was like watching all this stuff. There's a great documentary about uh, the geniuses behind the, the building of the Disney theme parks. They're architects and they're artists and sculptors. And it just, this is fantastic. And uh, in, in one of them, they describe building Cinderella's castle in, in Disney World in, in France. And they had to cut corners they were trying to build it on the cheap, but they wanted it to look tall and, and, and majestic. So it's just this soaring thing in the middle of the theme park, but it's actually not as tall as it looked. They said they used a trick whereby they painted the color scheme going from darker at the bottom to lighter at the top. So that when you stand there, it looks much taller uh, than it actually uh, is. See, so your eye is tricked into thinking that the building is different than what it is. In the same way, you can't build a building by just looking at a corner, looking at an angle, and saying, well, look straight to me. Mm -mm. You have to have a a straight edge. You get some kind of standard that is not your judgment, okay? Something that is external to you, something that's perfect, something that's that's unchangeable, and, and that's specific, okay? Now, how do you make moral decisions then? you need a straight edge. What is, what is your straight edge? Well, I can tell you most people use the three E's. Do you know what the three E's of, 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 of making decisions are? Here they are. One of them is expectations. What do you use to make moral uh, decisions? What do other people think? What does the Gallup poll say? You know, what's public opinion? What do the experts say? What does my peer group say? Uh, you know, what do most people say? That's expectations. The second E you can use is emotions, right? It's not just Barbara Mandrell singing, how can it be wrong if it feels so right? That's a cultural dynamic, emotions. If it feels right, do it. And, and then the third, you make moral decisions, uh, if we'll admit it, is, is ease. Very often we make moral decisions not based on what we think is right or wrong, but by which is the path of least resistance, right? Which is the, the, the way of the least confrontation? What's going to get us out of here without a fight? right? So expectations, emotions, ease, but can I tell you, none of those are a straight edge. See, you need something much more specific than that to make moral decisions because those things are always changing. Those things are shifting around all the time. Somebody says, well, Anthony, I'm with the Beatles. I just think all you need is love. Okay, well, I'm a child of 90s, you know, techno dance music so I say what is love baby don't hurt me don't hurt me right what is love it's so subjective you you can't love isn't a straight edge okay certainly not as pop culture uh, defines love your emotions aren't a straight edge the Gallup poll isn't a straight edge and the Bible says you will be a total mess your house will be crooked as all you ever go to the uh, I think it was Six Flags or something. They had a house that's all crooked. You go in there and it's all these weird angles. That's going to be your life unless you're willing to base all moral values on, on moral absolutes. All right? So what's the straight edge? The Bible says what? The law of the Lord. The ordinances of the Lord. The precepts of the Lord are altogether righteous. In other words, here's the doctrine. The Bible says the law of God is not a set of abstractions. It's not an abstract code of conduct. It is actually just a description of God's own moral excellence. It's the depiction of God's own glorious goodness. And therefore, it is also a description of your own humanity and the reality of what this great creator has created. Let me me give you a quick example of how this works. Somebody says, you know, do you believe lying is bad? Let's, let's be real, real concrete with it. Uh, imagine for a moment you're a, a public school teacher, and God bless our school teachers. My goodness, I was just talking to somebody, how'd it go this week? Oh, 
It's hard enough to teach and go back to school without having to be a computer program at the same time and learn all these, you know, so it, it's tough. But imagine you're a school teacher teaching a bunch of, bunch of at-risk uh, eighth graders. Is anybody worse than eighth graders? Uh, but these kids, they lie with abandon. They, they cheat all the time. They steal. Uh, it's just the example that's all around them. They see it from their, their, their parents to their peers. Uh, and, and so you want to convince these kids that lying is, uh, is, is bad. How will you do it? Well, somebody says, well, you tell them that lying is bad um, because it hurts your, your conscience. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll feel bad. And these eighth graders sit there and go, well, now I know that teacher is stupid because yeah, maybe when I was in sixth grade and I lied, I felt bad, but then I got over it. I, don't, I feel just fine now. It used to bother my conscience. It doesn't bother at all. If I don't mind, it doesn't matter. Okay. Well, then tell them you shouldn't lie because lying is not uh, loving to people. But again, don't forget what we just said. You can define love any old way you want. Tons of people lie in the name of love. I once had a family in the church and the, uh, uh, the matriarch of the family, the grandmother, the doctor told them that she was dying. She was going to die. And they weren't going to tell her. And, and I said, you got to tell her. She deserves to, it wasn't like she was out of her mind. She needs to know to prepare her heart and prepare her relationships. Oh no, pastor, that wouldn't be loving. Love is totally subjective. Okay. Here's another one. Let's just say uh, lying is wrong because it's bad for society. And, and, and that is true. It, it, it's true if, if everybody lies. By the way, the communists know this uh, because one of the reasons that communism collapsed is that it was just expected that everybody up and down the chain was lying. Just when you turn on the news at night, you knew they were lying. It was just expected that, uh, you know, everywhere, the government agencies lied, the businesses lied. And when there's no societal expectation for truth, uh, the government can't work, the economy can't work, the, the, the civil organizations can't work. And, that, and so that's what happened to the communists. Just the, just, just the communists. But it's true, lying is, is bad for society. It's terrible for society. But do you think that's going to convince those eighth grade kids? Right? I can just see these eighth graders say, okay, let me get this straight. If I cheat on this test, all of Western society is going to come falling to the ground, crashing around my head. Come on. I can get away with it. You know, it's not going to hurt anybody. Right? So, so when you base your moral values on anything but moral absolutes, the nature of God, the way things are, if you base it on conscience, if you base it on feelings, if you base it on the three E's, if you base it on some contentless idea of love, if you base it on social utility, first of all, your theory is theoretically shallow. It, it, it doesn't explain things. It, it, it says if everybody lies, society won't work fine, but why won't society work? Why? See, the Bible goes deeper than the social theories. Here's what the Bible says. It says here's why it won't work. Because God tells the truth. Because God is a truth teller. The world God created doesn't work if you lie because God is a truth teller. He created a reality that when you lie, you set up strains in the structure of life that will lead to a breakdown. That is a theory that is, is, is adequate. It's, it's deep. Any other way of talking about why lying is wrong doesn't go uh, deep enough. It doesn't explain why. It's theoretically inadequate. Not only that, any other way of basing moral values is pragmatically ineffective. See, nobody's going to stop lying if all you do is say, oh, it's not loving, it'll hurt society. The only proper moral restraint is to be able to say to somebody, listen, God tells the truth. And God has therefore built your life, your heart, our society, uh, and built the world for truth tellers. And if you don't tell the truth, as it says in Proverbs 19.9, a false witness will not go unpunished and whoever pours out lies will perish. That's why you don't lie. It's wrong because it's based on a universal moral absolute. It's based on the nature of God and the fabric of reality. And when you lie, you cut your own throat, whether you realize it in the moment or not. You've laid the wrong angle for your foundation, and the whole building is going to become crooked and eventually going to fall down all around your ears. There's no other way of grounding people in values 
than that. Ground it in social theory. Ground it in emotions. Ground it in your feelings. Everybody's going to run right past you. They will laugh in your face. Therefore, the Bible says the only straight edge is that which issues from the Lord. Moral absolutes that issue from the Lord. It's of the Lord. This is why, by the way, the Nicene Creed begins, I believe in the God of, who created all the heavens and the earth, both seen and unseen. It's a creation account. Okay, let's move on. But, but one, one quick point real quick before we do. What about our modern value that it's wrong to impose your values on other people? I know that's a very popular train of thought. Uh, but again, can I tell you, it, it falls down just on the basis of reason alone. If values are personal and, re and, and relative, why then is it actually wrong to impose your values on other people? As soon as you talk about uh, tolerance, I'm, I'm not against tolerance, I'm a big fan of tolerance, but, it, but at some point you gotta say, if that's something that everybody has to observe, you have described a universal absolute that everybody has to obey whether or not you agree with it or feel it or not. So where do you get the basis for that? Uh, we, we do this almost every week here, but moral relativism is an impossible uh, position to be in. Just ask the question, is uh, the statement that all morals are relative, uh, is that relative itself? See, it's a logic trap. I'll say this, of course, most people aren't really interested in what's logical. You're not gonna get anywhere with that, all right? But the fact is, uh, moral values have got to be grounded in moral absolutes or we live uh, in an impossible situation. It's really more of a question of which moral absolutes, right? Because the law of the Lord is perfect. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and, and, and righteous. But let's be fair. Let, let's not dismiss the toleration question just yet. Because, of course, anyone... Can, can, can show you examples from history in which people claiming moral absolutes have in fact uh, inflicted great evil and pain on, on other people and on, on society. So how do, we, how do we answer that? Well, it has to do with the second point. This is a little bit briefer, but we gotta point it out. And that's this. Secondly, submission to God's moral absolutes does not enslave, it, it liberates. It says the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The law, the precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. See, one of the central tenets of modern philosophy is that it is oppressive and it's enslaving to submit to somebody else or some other body of values. Every human being needs to be free to fashion his or own set of moral values. Therefore, to submit to anything is oppressive, right? I mean, this is true. We don't even name our kids. Used to be everybody named their kid, you know. Is it Michael? Is it John? Is it... No. Back in, in, in my day, you didn't want to name your kid something weird. They'd stick out. Now, if you don't name your kid something weird, they say, I'm not, I got Anakin Ari. That's not normal. You know, even if you're going to name your kid John, you got to sneak a silent cue in there, right? We gotta, no, don't oppress us with being the same as everybody else. We all got to be our own thing. That's, that's the world we're living in. And to, and to oppress somebody, to put them into a category is... Is, 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 is deadly. Well, the Bible says, no, no, no. Not if you submit yourself to the moral absolutes of God. In that case, it actually brings liberation. And, and here's why. We mentioned it, but it says in verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Let's put it this way. The, the Bible teaches us, and common sense teaches us, that real freedom is always found in restrictions. Real freedom only happens when you find the right restrictions. Okay, a life without restrictions is not liberation, but it always leads to uh, destruction. Let me give you an example of this. And uh, allow me to, by doing so, uh, introduce you to my daughter's new friend. So my daughter has gone off to college, and one of the first things she did is go out and buy a pet to keep her company. And so meet Peter Parker. This is Peter Parker. It's her new fish. She named that because he's red and blue, and so he looks like Spider-Man. Uh, now, Peter, uh, you can't see it there, but he is restricted to a three-gallon tank that she keeps on the shelf uh, next to her, her bed. But let's decide that uh, Annika, you know, she's off in college now, and she's getting her head filled with all kinds of new ideas, and she decides, wait a minute, it's, it's oppressive uh, to, to keep Peter, you know, trapped in this tank. So I'm going to take him out 
and, 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 and let him have free roam of the room. In fact, free roam of the house. So she takes him out of the tank and, and, and puts him down on the carpet. What's happened? You've immediately begun to kill him, right? But, but you know, if she puts him back into his restrictive tank, he immediately begins to breathe again. He's revived. He, he begins to come back to life. He begins to experience liberty again. See, his liberty was actually destroyed out of the water until you put him back in. You get the fish into the right environment, and it has freedom. See, it's the wrong environment that means no freedom. Let me ask you a question. What does a polar bear in Miami and a jogger on Venus have in common? The answer is they're both dead. <laughs> they're both dying. See, why? Because they're in the wrong environment. The uh, jogger's out there and he just, she's running along, but her lungs aren't built to process the Venusian ammonium atmosphere, right? And, and the polar bear's not able to handle 100 degrees in the shade. And, and so they're dying, but get them out of that environment and they revive. Get them back in the right environment and they revive. I was talking to a lady here in the church not long ago, and, and for years she worked in, a, uh, in, in, in corporate America, and uh, she was very successful, but she just realized she was, she was really dying. She was chafing uh, while working for this big corporation, and finally uh, she took a risk and went into business for herself. And, and, and everything changed, see? Uh, she was an entrepreneur. That was her spirit. That was how God had designed her. She chafed working under other people. She was frustrated under the restrictions. And she would try another company, another thing. It wasn't that company. It's just the way God made her. She was just made to be self-employed. So that was the environment in which she took off. You see? What do all these people have in common? They were not able to be free. The polar bear, the entrepreneur, the Venetian jogger, the fish, until they found the right restrictions. See, for the fish to be liberated, it has to say no to walking. The, the polar bear has to say no to Miami. The entrepreneur has to say no to Dell. It wasn't Dell, but you know, it's a corporation. There's no freedom unless you know the right uh, restrictions. There's no freedom unless you find the right restrictions. There's no freedom without a no. And so to say that freedom is the ability to have no restrictions doesn't make any sense. And let me tell you, if that's true physically, if that's true vocationally, it has to be true spiritually as well. The Bible says there's only one proper environment for you to spiritually and personally be able to become everything that a human being is supposed to be, and that is the environment of the commands of God. The law of the Lord is perfect reviving the soul. You need the moral authority of God. You need the moral restrictions of God to revive yourselves. And there are thousands of people in the world. There are, are, are plenty of people watching this sermon right now, maybe in this room, and you would say, absolutely. It, it, it wasn't until I said no to the things that God's law said to say no to. It wasn't until I came under the commands of God that then my marriage revived and my work life revived and my uh, self-esteem revived, my psyche revived. The law of the Lord is perfect. Okay, so the second point is that when you submit to these moral absolutes, they are not destructive, but they liberate. So first, your so-called moral values have to be based on absolutes, uh, and those moral absolutes do not destroy, but they liberate. Okay, now I told you there's three points to this sermon, and uh, you've only heard two. So up to now, you might assume that what I'm uh, saying and what the Bible is saying is that the way to answer the search for values is just to go back to the Ten Commandments, right? Just go back to traditional values. Let's just get our society uh, back there. Is that all it's saying? Is that all the Bible is saying? No. Remember, that's what a certain branch of Christianity tried to do in the 90s. Didn't work. Can't work. The other branch of Christianity tried to do it in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Another did it in the 18th century. Can't work. Won't work. Why? Because the third thing this passage teaches us and the Bible teaches us it's this, the moral absolutes of God will destroy you unless they have assumed the right role in your life. Listen very carefully. Up to now, maybe all I've shown you is that the law 
of God is, is real uh, and, and that the law of God is, is, is necessary. It's, it's real, so you owe God obedience, and it's necessary, so you need obedience. But I'm telling you, it's not as simple as that. I, I'm here to tell you, you can admire the law of God, you can love the law of God, you can obey the law of God and have it destroy you if you don't understand the role that it's supposed to play. Uh, Said so like this, the NBA playoffs are going on. Any Mavs fan? Are there any Mavs fans in Austin? I don't know. I came from the Metroplex. They're playing today. Uh, imagine a team, and it wouldn't be the Mavs, but imagine a team has the best point guard and the best center in the league. That's a hard combination to beat, right? But take those stellar athletes and reverse their roles. Right? Put the big guy out on the outside and, 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 and put the little guy in the paint. They won't win a single game. Terrific athletes, right? But they're in the wrong role. And every good coach uh, can tell you that. And I'm here to tell you that you can love the law of God. You can try to obey the law of God. But if you don't understand its proper role, the role it's supposed to play in the human life, it can ruin you. It can destroy you. In fact, this is why people chafe on, oh, the law of the Lord. I've seen people... The people that have abused the law of the Lord in ch church history over the years have not understood the proper role of the law. So here's what the role is. And you have to stand back for a minute and look at the whole sweep of Psalm 19. Remember we said it's divided into two parts. The first six verses tell you that if you just look at the heavens and you look at the sun and you look at the moon and the stars, they will tell you there's a God. What Psalms 19 is saying in verses 1 through 6 is that if you listen, even there, 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 there no, are, are no words, the sun, the moon, the stars, the, the spacious firmament is telling you that there's a great and glorious creator behind it all. But Psalm 19 shows us that the natural revelation that comes to us through creation is not sufficient to know God personally. Uh, in, in, in fact, the way verse 6 describes the sun, you may pick up on this, it could just as easily be describing the Roman deity Apollos, who rides his chariot across the sky, right? In other words, nature tells you that there's a God, but not the God. And the way that this psalm gets that across is, is not obvious reading it in English, but it is absolutely stunning and brilliant in Hebrew. In the first six verses, the nature verses, the name of God that's used is Elohim. That's what's translated as God. In the last eight verses, from verse 7 through 14, the only name that, for God that's used in the Hebrew is the, the Hebrew word Yahweh which is translated the Lord. Anytime you see in the Old Testament, the Lord, L-O-R-D capitalized, that's code for Yahweh. What does this mean? It means this, the word Elohim is a generic name for God. The generic name means the divine one, uh, the great one. And you can use Elohim for capital G God and lowercase g God. But the word Yahweh is the personal name for God that he revealed to Moses from the burning bush as the name uh, that he gives to the people to whom he calls his own. It, 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 it's roughly analogous to this. If you come up to me and said, hello, Dr. Skoma, and I say, oh, please call me Anthony, right? When you say, please call me by my first name, what you're saying is, I want to have a relationship with you. Right? I want to be a friend. So in verse 1 through 6, by using the word Elohim again and again and again, the psalmist is saying, look, it's great to use your reason. It's great to see the sun and the moon and the stars, uh, and it's great for you to infer and to deduce that there is a God, but that will never get you to know him personally. See, if you want to know God personally, you have to go to his revealed word. You have to go to the prophets. You have to go to the Bible. You have to go to the law. Because there in verse 7 through 12, he starts saying, if you want to know the Lord, if you want to know God personally, you have to look at the perfect law and you have to look at the righteous law. But I want to show you, to look, even that's not enough. Because you see, there, there's a wonderful psychological order uh, to, this, to this psalm. The first six verses say, you look at the sky and you see that there's a God there in, in general, but you'll never know him personally. And so the next series of verses say, you look in his word and you see how holy he is and you see how perfect he is. But I want you to see what happens in verse 12. Suddenly the psalmist says, who can discern his errors? Not God's errors, his own errors. 
Who can discern my errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. Uh, May they not rule over me. Why is this the right psychological order? Here's what happens. And this will always happen to you. The, the, The more you look at the law of God trying to know him, Friends, I have seen this happen a million times. People begin to wake up. They begin to say, okay, I, I, I need God. I need God in my life. I need faith in my life. This is why some of you uh, are, are here. So many people have a general belief in God or maybe no belief in God, and then something uh, happens in their life. They realize for a, a myriad of reasons, I need God in my life. I need something more than I have. So you start coming to church, and you start reading your Bible, and you start seeing what the Bible says. And when you read these things, the Bible says right? Be generous, be honest, be loving, be compassionate, be humble, be wise, be gentle, be powerful, be approachable, be courageous. And you read all that and and you nod your head. But what it's doing is it begins to dishearten you, right? It just starts to make you tired. Oh, Lord. All this, right? And, And this is what happens to the psalmist. He looks at the law of God and he says, the law of God is perfect and and it's altogether righteous and it's radiant. But then you have to, you have to begin to say, but wait a minute, I'm imperfect. I'm unrighteous. I'm not radiant, I'm confused. The law of God will do that to you every time. And the first thing I wanna tell you is that's good. That's good because the first role of the law, as God intended it, the first role of the law of God in your life is to swamp you just like that. You're supposed to feel like that because Christianity is for moral failures and only for moral failures. Do you hear me? Jesus said this, I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. What does that mean? He says, if you think you're righteous, If you look at the law of God and you go, check, I obey that. I've I've kept that all my life. I've always kept the Ten Commandments. If you look at the moral law of God and it doesn't swamp you, if it makes you feel righteous instead of like a terrible sinner, if you feel you're a moral success, if you object to that statement and say, Anthony, well, I don't feel like a moral failure. You're not a Christian. You're not. Jesus said, I didn't come for people who think they're righteous. You can only be a Christian through Christ. Jesus, I didn't come for you. I didn't come for anybody like that. Christianity is for moral failures and only for people who know their moral failures. And the way you find that out is the law comes and swamps you. You see what the law of God requires and it's wonderful and you say, of course we should be generous like that and of course we should be compassionate as the law said. Of course we should be as kind as the law says. Of course we should be as honest as the law said. Of course we should be as as principled as the law said. But I'm not and I never will be, not in this life. That's good. And unless the law is doing that to you, the law is going to kill you. If it's making you smug, if it, it, it means you're not understanding it. I always say, if you sit here and hear a sermon, you go, oh, so-and-so needs to hear this. You're doing it wrong. You're doing it. Now, if you go, oh, God, cleanse my heart. This is killing me. This is, oh, I got to share this with my brother because you know, we're in the same boat. Then you, okay. But if anybody here does not see that they're moral failure, if anybody thinks, oh, I'm a decent person, I live according to the Ten Commandments, the law of decency, I'm telling you, you haven't looked at it closely enough, and they are going to strangle you. Because unless the law of God plays the right role in your life, you will be destroyed. And the first role of the law is it should show you that you're a sinner. That's the, the first role of the law. Paul says in Galatians chapter 3 that the law is a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. The job of the law is to show us uh, that we need exactly what happens here in in Psalm 19 because the psalmist looks at the law and he sees how perfect it is and he sees how wonderful it is. And by verse 12, he's, oh my gosh, (laughs) I'm not that. I'm full of flaws. I'm I'm, I'm full of of, of error. And, And then at the very end, he begins to cry out. Cry out for what? Anybody remember the last two verses of the psalm, the last two words? My redeemer. And, and that's the job of the law. The job of the law is to say you're a moral failure and you need a redeemer. That's the first role. Is it playing that in your life? 
The second role the law of God should play in your life is it should push you to see what Jesus has done for you. It should get you to see who the Redeemer is. We have an advantage on David because he hadn't seen the Redeemer yet, but we have. And that's what Psalm 19 does. It pushes you to say, I need a redeemer. Let's go back to Paul. Uh, and, and this verse, guys, if you get this verse in your soul, you should all write this verse down. You should all go meditate on this verse this week. Like you should read the whole book of Galatians. But you get this down, you can live off it for the rest of your life. Galatians 4, 4 and 5 says this, but when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman. What's that mean? Born into the creation of the first part of Psalm 19. He wasn't a ghost. He was born of a woman the same way everybody else was. He fulfilled the nature part. Born under the law, the second half of verse 19, of, of chapter 19. To what? To redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights of sons. See, the Christian reads the law in an entirely unique way. Anybody else? Tell me if this is how you read the law. When you look at all those wonderful, terrifying things in the law, when it says, be generous, be courageous, be humble, be loving, be wise, be gentle, be approachable, be powerful, all those things, they're wonderful, they're terrifying. But a Christian reads them and says, my Savior has done all this. Every one of these things, and he's done it for me. He was born under the law. That means he was responsible to the law, and he completely fulfilled it so that we might not earn but receive the rights of sonship. He lived the life I should have lived. He paid the debt I should have paid. Listen, everybody in this room, deep down, knows that they should be perfect. Please hear me. You, you might not admit it, but you know it. It's an emotional reality. And apart from Christianity, there are only two ways to deal with it. The first way is just to try to kill it. Right, to, to destroy your own moral sensitivity, to say that nobody's perfect. Uh, you know, there's, there's all kinds of ways to do it. You can, you know, medicate it out of existence, you can whatever. Or uh, you do what most people say, uh, well, you know, I'm not perfect, but I'm better than most. Well, I'm better than, you know, we find somebody a little further down the chain. And, and so you just try to kill your perfectionism. You, you, you try to kill it, you attack your own uh, moral sensitivity. Go ahead, that's one way to do it. The other way is to let it drive you so that you have to achieve the perfect body, the perfect relationship, the perfect record, the perfect job, the perfect home, the, these you know, perfect family moments and so on. And so you can either deal with this emotional reality by trying to kill your own moral sensitivity or by letting it drive you into the ground or, and, and the only other alternative I know is this, Christianity alone refuses to minimize the reality uh, that you know you should be perfect, but it, it addresses it. it. It says the gospel is you must never trust in anything uh, that you are doing, that you can do, that you will do, that you have done, but you say, Lord, accept me strictly totally, fully, and completely because of what your son, Jesus Christ, did for me. He fulfilled the law. And when you look at the law, you see that he has done it. You ever read these Psalms and you go, but the righteous person will do this. And you go, well, this Psalm's not for me. No, it's for Jesus. And he did it. And if you're in him, then it is for you. Because you say the righteous person will do this. And Jesus, you've done that for me. So in me, I am this. When God sees me, he sees Christ in me. He sees this dynamic. He's done every one of those things. Is that the role that the law plays in your life? Do you read it that way? First, the law is there to swamp you. Secondly, the law is there to show you what Jesus has done for you. We like to say that the gospel humbles you to the ground and lifts you to the heavens at the same instant. You got to have both. But then thirdly and lastly, the role of the law is to show you how to give pleasure to God. Okay, now think about this. The law is not a ladder to heaven. It's not the stairway to heaven. If I do these things, God will accept me. Nope. The law, the purpose of the law is not pragmatic. If I do these things, God will help me. Nope. The law will grind you if that's the role that it plays in your life. That's why you have so many mean Christians. They're going to the law, but they're going to it for those first two things. 
and it's absolutely killing them and they're miserable and misery loves company. Nope. But if you see the purpose of the law is to show you first and foremost that you're a moral failure. And secondly, to show you that what Jesus, who wasn't a moral failure, what he has done for you, then when you know he's done this for you, you've received him as savior, then the purpose of the law begins to show you how to give God pleasure. Let me put it this way. How do you know you're in love with somebody? You begin to experience their desires, the things that delight them and the things that they want as commands. Oh, they're not coercive. But you want to find those things. You want to know what pleases the beloved. You want to know what delights the beloved. I have a set of commentaries over my office. I don't use them much. They're, they're old. They're from the 19th century. And I've just, you know, there's a lot of more practical things that I use. But I love them. It's the pulpit commentary. I sit up there. And I love them because my wife, when we were dating, she knew my love of books. And I got called into ministry. And I was just beginning to assemble the grand library that I now have. And, uh, and she went out and found this set. Somebody was a retired minister was selling it. And she went, drove all the way like three hours away on a weekend to buy me this set. Why? Because I coerced her or said, no. She just was falling in love with me and, and wanted to, to, to do something, you know, that I desired. And so when you find that out, what? His wish, her wish becomes your command. When you're in love, you experience the things that give the beloved pleasure uh, now, and, and, and they're not just commands. You love to fulfill them, right? Here's how you know you're in love. You know you're in love when the pleasure of giving pleasure is greater than the pleasure of taking pleasure. Young people, every one of you should, I'd say, write it down. Take out your phone and take a picture of that. You know you're in love when the pleasure of giving pleasure is greater than the pleasure of taking pleasure. We live in a consumer society that says that the, the heartbeat of it is, is how much can you get, right? A bargain is I get more and you give more than I have to give up, and that is not love. And there are two things that happen when you begin to find the pleasure of giving pleasure. You change personally and your relationship deepens. And can I tell you it's the same thing with God? What is the law of God? The law of God is a list of things that give him delight. Do you want a relationship with God? Why should you obey the Bible? Why should you obey the Ten Commandments? Why should you confess your sins? Why should you wrestle like crazy to be as holy as you can in every part of your life? Not to get to heaven. You'll never climb that ladder. Not so God will answer your prayers. He's not Santa Claus, no. but because you want to know God better. The purpose of the law is to know God more intimately. The purpose of the law is to get the pleasure of giving pleasure, which is the greatest pleasure. There. What is the purpose of knowing God, of, of obeying God? To know Him, not to manipulate. Not to pull strings to get him to do things. Can I tell you, God is already willing to do everything. But he's saying, obey me so that we can be friends. Obey me so that I can be your father. Obey me so I can pour myself into you in the way that I most desire to do, in the way that you most desperately need. Because that's how I built you from the creation of the world. The law is utterly different to a Christian than to anybody else. The rebel despises the law. The moralist fears the law. But the Christian delights in the law. It's sweeter than honey, honey from the cone. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O oh God, our rock and our Let's pray. Father God, right now, all of us come to you with some relationship to your law, and I don't know what that looks like. It's been, it's different for different people. It's different for different stages of life or different places we come from. Some people are ignorant of the law. They're, they're coming into this thing from a completely uh, pagan background. They haven't, you know, they've been building their own morality, and they're realizing, wow, this is a different standard completely. 
that. It is going to take your Holy Spirit to convince them of the truth of that. I can't do it. I can't debate anybody into the values of the kingdom of heaven. They are simply too uh, upside down by appearance to the values that we see in this world over and over again. And so my prayer this morning is that the Holy Spirit would do part of what his role is, is to convict us of, of, of sin, to convict us of the greatest sin being idolatry, that we have looked to created things and worship them instead of the creator. This is the first half of Psalm 19, that we have looked at the mountain and said, wow, what, a, what an impressive mountain. Let's worship that mountain. Instead of saying, oh, let's worship the one that built the mountain. And maybe we say, oh, there's none of us are pagans like this. I don't worship mountains. That's primitive. No, no, we look to a job and say, let's worship the job. Let's look to the job to get our sense of worth and, 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 and security and, 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 and purpose. And you say, no, 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 I, I created you for the job or the job for you. I didn't create you to worship the job. I didn't create you to worship the relationship. Getting it out of order. So God, would you, through your Holy Spirit, convict us. Be that schoolmaster. Teach us. Remind us of all the things that Jesus said and show us how we don't measure up. But don't leave us there. And we know that you won't because your Holy Spirit longs to connect us, to bring us into the Holy Roman. God, the, the reality is there's another group of people here and they, they are not younger brother lost. They, they're not ignorant of the law at all. They could quote it to you. They might have won sword drills. They might have won Bible quizzes. But deep down, they hate the law. The, oh, they talk a good game. They look, a good, they look better than any of us in this room. But deep down, they know they don't measure. They're like Martin Luther, that miserable monk who just did it all right during the day, but at night lay on his bed in misery. The flames of hell were looking at him because he knew he didn't measure up. Now yeah, we can't do it. It, it. It's got to drive us to look for a redeemer. And so... God, I pray that, that your Holy Spirit would drive us as a schoolmaster, drive us from our ignorance of the law and drive us from our misunderstandings of the law and finally do what it's meant to do, which is drop us on our knees at the foot of the cross and to look up and to see our Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ, who did it all perfectly and got crushed in not for his own sins, but for ours. And because of that, God, we can walk into a new confidence that yes, God, we don't measure up to the law and we never will. That's okay. At the same time, we don't willfully ignore it. No, we ask you every morning, every day, help us today to walk in the law better than we did yesterday. Why? So that we'll earn it? No. No. No, but so that we'll have a closer relationship with and through that, we'll be able to demonstrate to our friends, to our neighbors, what true love and joy and peace and goodness and patience, and kindness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control, what those things look like that they desperately need in their lives. And we'll only get them in our lives as we come to you, as we abide in your mind and live in your law, the law that's like honey on this. We ask this in the name of the Father, name of the Son and the name of the Holy Spirit as it was as it is and as it evermore will be in Jesus name we pray amen amen well thanks for being here today and uh, it's sure good to see you guys that, uh, that have showed up in, in person I know it's still it's still wonky none of us quite know somebody asked how much longer are we doing the masks? I don't know. We'll, I, I kind of think folks are waiting to see how back to school goes. You know, let's, let's give this a few weeks and kind of see how it goes and we'll see. But uh, we're, 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 somebody said, I, you know, I haven't done, I was doing the midweek uh, uh, updates for a while on COVID, kind of a Wednesday video thing. And uh, honestly, I didn't know how many people were watching that or not. You know, it's kind of like, is it just you're shouting into the void when you're here? But Sarah Blue said, I kind of miss those. You know, I said, okay, well, I might do some more of them. It's, the reality is not much has changed. We're still kind of doing the same thing. But as school gets back, I, I do have some thoughts, and, and uh, so we may talk about that. But just keep working with us. Uh, we, we know that we're, we're not going to be able to go much further on it until we're able to bring back 
uh, preschool, nursery, elementary, those kind of things. We're such a family-driven church. Um, but, you know, we, we've always said we take our cues from uh, the city, from the school districts and, and those things, and we'll let them figure it out <laughs> before we make a move. So uh, it'll be, you know, uh, a few more weeks at the, at the earliest, but uh, thanks for sticking in with us and those of you at home. Um, just encourage you. Make, make a routine of this, though. Let's start getting back into the, we can still get back into the back to school. I don't know about you. I've always, in the summer, our family kind of gets lazy. You know, we don't get up quite as early. You don't, you know, you go to bed a little bit later. But then it seems like back to school kind of resets that. You know, we've lost one kid. I don't know when the other one goes. Deanna and I may become, I don't know, just like hermits. I, you know, what's, what's going to keep us in this, in this rhythm? We don't have school anymore. But uh, it is important to begin to build back some of those routines into our lives. So I would encourage you. Uh, if you're at home, start building back the church routine into your life. I don't necessarily mean coming here, but setting up a time, whether it's at 9 o'clock to be live or you say, well, we're 11 o'clock people. Okay, but at 11 o'clock, sit down and hit play. Just, just keep a routine to it. Uh, I think that's important so that when we come out of this, you know, one of the things, if you go into a, 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 you know, a, a coma, when you come out, you got to relearn to walk because your muscles have atrophied, right? So the more you can keep some uh, routine going, the better you'll be in the long run. So I would encourage that for you uh, and, and for your kids. We're looking at some things we can do uh, for the kids in, the, in this uh, back-to-school time because their spiritual development uh, is, is just as important as their, uh, uh, their academic development and, and their relation development, all those things, all right? Well, thanks for being here today. We're going to receive the morning's tithes and offerings. And again, thank you so much. Uh, just again, on the uh, Back to School Bash, what an incredible uh, success. The county people that were here were just saying again, man, how, how grateful they were uh, for you. And I know not as many of you got to actually physically see it this year uh, because of the restrictions. But let me tell you, the, the smiles were real and the impact we've had on the community uh, is real. So thank you again for that. I'm just so proud of, of, of this church and, uh, and, and the way we're able to, uh, to do those things. So as always, five ways to give. You can mail it in. If you guys are here, you can drop it in. But most likely, if you're like 86 now, about 90% of the people, you're going to either text it in, go to the mobile app, or go to the website and do it digitally. And you have been doing that. Let's keep it going. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're doing well, but it's not the time to let up now. So uh, thank you for your giving. Uh, and as you go, remember three things. God loves you very, very much. He made you special, and he's got a special plan for your life this week. Go in the grace of God.